Hey there! Whether you're a part of our church family or you're a friend tuning in, we love that you're here and we pray that today you might hear from God. This message is a part of our series where we're working our way through the Gospel of John. And throughout John's Gospel, we see Jesus for who He truly is. He's the promised Messiah, the Son of God, and He's the Savior of the world. You know, it's our joy to be able to provide access to teaching, worship, and other resources to equip and train the Church of Jesus. And while we are encouraged for you to benefit from them, we do ask that these would only be supplemental and in no way replace a commitment to gathering and learning within a local church body. These resources are gifts of God's grace for people to grow with, but they're never meant to replace a belonging to a covenant community of faith. If you'd like to learn more about Center Grove Church and what we're up to, head over to cglife.org and you can follow us on Instagram and Facebook at Center Grove. And if you'd like to reach out, you can simply email us at info at cglife.org. Now, we pray that God stirs in your heart as you listen to the proclamation of His Word. Good morning. We are uh, blessed today, are we not? Blessed today. I was thinking as we were uh, singing that song making, about making room and making room for the, uh, for the Lord to work, what a, what a blessing that is to be able to be used of God. What a privilege it is to have this gift of time to be able to give ourselves to something greater than ourselves, to be able to say to God, here is room. Do what you need to do with me, in me, so that you can do what only you can do through me. I will make room for you. What a declaration. And for some people, that kind of declaration is dangerous, but... For the faithful follower of Christ, it opens the door to uh, a life that we love to describe as extraordinary. Extraordinary. And so I'm, I'm excited to see you here today. We want to talk about being bright lights in dark places. This is our theme for the year, and we've been unpacking what that means in the last couple of Sundays. We're we're launching the year with a challenge to individuals, to families, to life groups, to our church, to intentionally be bright lights in dark places in 2023. And we've seen how this challenge comes from Jesus in Matthew chapter 5, verse 16, where he, he basically, in that passage, does two things. He tells his followers that they are the light of the world and uh, that they essentially reflect his light of truth showing the way back to the life and the wholeness that God intended for all of us from the beginning, but we, we all abandoned. And secondly, we see how Jesus calls those who are his people to be intentional with their lives in letting his light and his life shine through theirs. And he uses this powerful illustration from everyday life in his day. He says that just in the same way that people take the lamp that they have, the common person would take that that one lamp they would have in their one room house and would take it and, and light it in the darkness and position it in the very best place possible so that everyone in that house might have the benefit of the light. 
Jesus says believers in the very same way are to take the light of Christ that he gives to them and reflect it to their house, to those spaces and places in their lives where other people are. And they're to keep that light bright and position it in their lives, in every area of their lives, in such a way that everyone who lives in their house, wherever that may be, everyone who lives lives in their lives, who has a connection with them, has the opportunity to see the light and to know the life that only Jesus can give. It's a powerful picture. Tend that light, keep it bright, take care to set it in the best place possible so everyone has a chance to see it. And so Jesus says in those uh, memorable words, let your light shine before others so that they may see your good works and give glory to your Father in heaven so that they can see and understand the good God has and the good God does and the good God is and the good God wants for those who are his by faith in his Son. So we've said believers, each believer and all believers are made and meant and sent to be lights in their dark places, wherever their dark places are. So a fundamental question we've been wrestling with in the last couple of Sundays is this, how do believers let their light shine in a dark world? Or using Jesus' lamp and house illustration, how do believers shine their light in the, in the houses, in the places and spaces where God has placed them to spend their days with other people? How do they let the light of Christ shine into the lives of the people where they find wherever they stay and play and shop and eat and work and network and worship in their neighborhoods, among their extended families, where they attend school, where they get help, where they receive help. How do you let your light shine in all the spaces and places of your house? How do I do that in mine? Last week, we began to look at a passage that helps answer these questions. It's an intriguing passage, and we're going to go there again today. Philippians chapter 2, and I invite you to turn with me there. The Apostle Paul takes up Jesus' call to believers to shine as the light of the world, and he shows believers how it's done in verses 12 through 16. And he, and he gives us guidance, and I love this. He gives us guidance for making the most of the light we have in the houses we live in with the time we've got. How do I, maybe that's the best way to put the question, how do I make the most of the light Christ has given me, the light of life, the light of truth and the gospel? How do I take that and make the most of it in the house I have as a mom? How do I do that? As a dad, how do I do that? As an empty nester, how do I do that? How do I do that in the areas where I shop and eat and stay and play and you get the idea? How do I do that with the time that I have? And of course, none of us knows how much time we have, do we? What we know we've got is right now, right now. Now, so how do I make the most of this light God has given me in Christ? We want to do that in 2023. We don't know if we're going to get all of 2023. Some people in this room will not get all of 2023. But by God's grace, trusting him, we, the question is, how can we make the most of 2023, whatever of 2023 we've actually got? How do we make the most of it? you have your Bibles, let's read together. Philippians 2, beginning at verse 12, Paul says, Therefore, my beloved brothers, my beloved ones, as you have always obeyed, so now obey, not only in my presence, but much more in my absence. Here's what I want you to do. Work out your own salvation with fear and trembling for, why? Why, why should I do that? For, let me tell you why you should, and by the way, let me tell you why you can, for it is God who works in you both to will and to work for his good pleasure. 
do all things without grumbling or questioning or disputing, that you may be blameless and innocent children of God without blemish in the midst of a crooked and twisted generation, among whom you shine as lights in the world. There's Paul picking up that phrase from Jesus in Matthew 5. Now, our Father, as we uh, are gathered around your word and as uh, we, we uh, present ourselves to you to hear from you today, we acknowledge that in Christ, uh, you've reached out to us and you have invited us to be your people with repentance from our sin, confession of our sin, and with faith in your Son. And to those who turn to you in that way, Father, you come and you, you begin a work. You give us new hearts. You give us new minds. You give us a, a new destiny, a new future, but you give us new lives here and now. And, and as you do all of this, you, you give us this additional gift. You adopt us. You bring us into your family. You make us your children. And you give us permission to call you our Father. And in truth, in Christ, you are. And as you remake us, as you give us new hearts and new minds and, and new lives, you shape us in the image of Jesus. And in doing so, you make us like yourself. By your grace, you leave us here in this world full of the darkness we've stepped out of into the light of the Christ you've given us. By your grace, you leave us here so that we might shine as lights in that dark world. So that others might see us and know something more of you so that others might hear from us and know something more of you. And this is our mission, this is our calling, and we acknowledge that this morning, and we're asking, Lord, that you would show us how, how it is we are to, to shine the, the best and the brightest, how we are to make uh, this mission ours and to be uh, walking with you faithfully in it, carrying out the call to be light when everything around us is dark. Help us in this, we pray. That's our heart in this today. For Jesus' sake, amen. Now, as we've said, uh, as Paul commands believers to work out their salvation, he's saying work out the consequences of it, work out the results of it with fear and trembling, out of respect and awe before God, remembering that it's God himself who works those results of new life into you, and he does it in such a way that, that, uh, you live, that we live, or believers live, out their new lives in Christ. They have the ability to do it, they have the desire to do it, they do it for his good pleasure, but it has an impact on the world. The world sees the difference. The idea here is for believers to progressively work out and make real in their day-to-day -day lives that new life that's already and forever theirs. It can be done. And so Paul is basically saying cooperate with God with what he's doing. Don't, 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 don't hinder him in what he's doing. Don't resist him in what he's doing. Work out with obedience what God is working into you. See, what, what, uh, this, this matters not just for you, but it matters for the world because what God is working into believers is meant to come out from believers as light for, for the world, a light that can change their destinies. What, God, what is exactly God working into his people so they shine his light? Well, Paul shows us in this passage a new attitude, a new character and conduct, and, and a new conviction. A new attitude, a new character and conduct, and a new conviction by which they are to live. Now, last week we said that he's working into us a new attitude, and we define that as an attitude that isn't selfish. There's no, some, no, no grumbling, no disputing. There's not selfishness. There's not self-centeredness. But there's an attitude, rather, that is very different. It is an attitude of glad, other-oriented self-denial that issues in service. The same attitude of Jesus. It's the kind of attitude that when a believer has it, they live saying habitually, Christ first, you second, and me third. Now today, though, we want to look at the character and conduct that he's working into his people. The two are very closely related. Now, my attitude is going to shape my character. My character has an impact on my, my conduct. How I think depends, uh, helps shape who I am, and who I am shapes what I do. Character and conduct are very much related, though. Uh, who we are, our character, drives how we live, our conduct. And you know this naturally. You don't live very long before you understand that people know the real us by what we show them over time. Who we are on the inside always comes 
out. Have you noticed? No matter how hard you try to keep it in, sooner or later, who you are comes out. So for believers to shine with the light of Christ before others requires not just that they have Christ's attitude toward the world, but they show his character and conduct to the world. So God is always working in the character of Christ and working in the conduct of Christ so that we might put Christ on display. Notice this new character and conduct in verses 14 to 15 as Paul describes it. He says, here's the attitude, verse 14. Do all things without grumbling or questioning. Rather, live like Christ. Look at chapter 2, verses 3 through 7 again. Do all things without grumbling or questioning. So, verse 15, that you may be, here are the key words, blameless and innocent and, uh, children of God without blemish. Blameless, innocent children of God without blemish as you live amidst in the middle of a crooked and twisted generation among whom you shine as lights in the world. God's work in giving us a new attitude is prep for his work of giving us a new character and a new conduct as his children. Now I want you to notice here we have a threefold description of the kind of people believers are to be before the world, their character, and the kinds of things believers are to do in the world, which has to do with their conduct. God is working in his children so that they are blameless and innocent and unblemished, a kind of people who do blameless, innocent, and unblemished kinds of things in this world. They do them not perfectly, but they do them persistently. They do them not perfectly, but they do them uh, uh, insistently. In other words, they are more and more like their father as they walk with him. Now, what's fascinating to me about these three words is that they describe the character and conduct God is working to, to give believers. They also describe the relationships, the key relationships believers are to have in the world with others, with themselves, and with God. And so I want to unpack these three words this morning so we can better understand what God is working into believers and what they should in turn be working out in their relationships so that they might shine as light in the world. Let's look at the first word, blameless. Blameless means free from fault. And it's a word that points especially to the believer's relationship with other people. So what God is working into us, first of all, is a blamelessness. So it points to our relationships. At the same time, it points to what believers are to be and bring to the world. And that is good and not harm. Paul is saying that authentic, obedient believers will live and relate to others in such a way that they avoid any cause for charges to be leveled against them by others for doing them harm. You, believers live in such a way in their relationships with others uh, in the body of Christ and outside the body of Christ. So when you're working, when you're, when you're doing your vet thing, it's your, your, you're relating to others in this way. And that is above reproach. With, so there's no way people can bring legitimate charges against you and say, you've harmed me, you've offended me, you've hurt me. It, I kind of like to look at it this way. He's saying believers will live in such a way that the only way people can bring charges against them and say, you've harmed me, you've hurt me, the only way they can do it is to make it up. The only way they can do it is to make it up. They have to invent it. Believers live in such a way that they have to invent it. Now, this means two things in the life of a believer. What God is, is working into us is a desire to keep our relationships clean and clear. Clean and clear. Clean and clear. By clean, what I mean is this, that God is, is working into us a desire to keep our relationships uh, uh, clean of, of offense and clear of offenses. By clean, I mean free of, of present or past offense. If, if I've harmed another person with the things I've said or the things that I've done, 
I'm going to be the kind of person that immediately makes it right. And I want to stress this. A believer is not perfect. A believer is going to mess up. I'm going to say things I shouldn't say. I'm going to do things I shouldn't do. The, the, the burden here is not for perfection. The call here is for persistence. So the, the intent of a believer who is living this, this life of blamelessness in relationships is I'm going to live in such a way that if and when I mess up, I'm one of those kinds of people that's going to be quicker to own it, not slower to own it. I'm going to be quicker to address it, not slower to address it. I'm going to own it. I'm going to confess it. I'm going to repent of it. That is, I'm going to do, to, by God's grace, stop doing it, turn from it, and I'm going to make restitution over it. I'm going to try to, the best I can, to replace what I've taken when I've harmed that person. I'll correct what I've said. I'll, I'll, I'll repay something that I've done. Does that make sense to you? This, this is the pattern. This is the habit of a believer who is letting God work into them help this, this blamelessness that comes out in relationships that are consistently healthy. So I want th that believer will first of all have clean relationships, but will also have what I like to call clear relationships. And that is they live in such a way that they are less and less likely to create offense and to do harm to others. We keep our relationships clear of any potential offense by intentionally doing others good and watching to avoid doing others harm. Jesus shows us in his Sermon on the Mount that authentic, obedient believers live in relationships with people in their world, in their world doing good works. And, and those are works that benefit, that help, that add value to the lives of others. Uh, believers do good by the world by doing the world good as Christ did and as he does. So rather than doing others harm and being open to blame, God's faithful are intentional and they're careful to bless others, to do good deeds that benefit the lost, deeds that come from being themselves loved and cared for by him who gave himself for them. And this again is why, again and again and again, we followers of Christ are found pointed and drawn to the cross. As you read the New Testament, you're going to find in Paul's letters, you find in the gospels, you find in Paul's letters, you find in all the literature of the New Testament. We're constantly driven again and again to the cross because what Christ has done for us is meant ultimately to define, to define who we are and how we live. Because he has been so good to us, because he has been so kind to us, because he has blessed us and done us the ultimate good, we aim to bless our world. We aim to lead the people in it, hopefully, to the same salvation in Christ Jesus that we've come to see and know. And this is why it becomes so important to know and understand your house, to understand what is in your house. Where are those places that your life takes you? Where is it that you shop and you eat? Where is it that you help and are helped? Where is it that you go to school, that you go to work? Where is it that you live? And who are those people in those places? Those are the people that God calls you by virtue of where you live and, and uh, the people who are in your house. That, those are the people to whom God calls you to be his light, to do good works, to do them good, so that this is how we operate in our house. Our house is, 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 is open from Sunday through Saturday, right? I've, I've been taking my granddaughter to, to basketball practices and basketball games. She's eight years old. And what I'm finding is I've got a whole new house. I've got a whole new house. You say, what do you mean? Well, I've got all these people now in, in my house that weren't there before I started attending eight-year-old girl basketball games, which are wonderful to watch, by the way. You see their little personality start to come out and their relationship with each other, with the ball, the basket, uh, the uh, umpires, the coach, everything. It's, 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 it's fascinating, but it, it's amazing. But I've seen some of you. I've actually seen quite a few of our members in those practices and at those games. You're acting really well. I'm so proud of you. <laughs> nobody's, nobody's let me down. It's been really good. 
Uh, but they're all part of, of the house, and, and in, in every place like that that we go, we're called to be light. Does that make sense to you? Blameless. We're to live in such a way we don't bring anyone offense or do anyone harm. If we do, we own it, we deal with it, we make it right, we move on. We live in such a way that we're always aiming. The best way to keep from doing people harm is to aim to do them good. Isn't that right? That's right. And so that's how we live. We're constantly, we should be constantly asking, what good can I do for you? Watch this, watch this. What good can I do for you that God can use to display the love and care and cry of Christ for you? What good can I do for you that God can use to draw you to himself? What good can I do for you that looks like Jesus, that loves like Jesus, that points like Jesus, that raises up in you the question why I would do what I've just done? It creates the opportunity for me to speak with my mouth a word of explanation that says the answer to your question is what Jesus has done for me and done for all on the cross. Does that make sense to you? This is our mission. This is actually why we're here. It's not to survive and it's not to thrive for ourselves. It's to take the opportunity God gives us in every space and place with every person to reflect the light of Jesus. So there's this blamelessness that should be about us. And uh, we have to be intentional. There's a partner word. Do you see it? It's innocence. A, a partner with this blamelessness is innocence. Innocent means without any addition or adulteration. The word was used in ancient times to, uh, uh, to speak of wine or milk that hadn't been mixed with water. Uh, it was used for metal that hadn't been uh, given an, an added alloy that would somehow weaken or cheapen it. When used to people, it, it, des it, describe, it was used to describe sincerity. An innocent person was a sincere person. It was a person whose motives and whose actions were all in alignment. So that what they were doing, if they were doing good, it was from a, what we would say, a, a, what, a good heart. Have you ever noticed someone, caught someone doing good, but you had a sense that the heart was not good behind the deed? How many of you have ever had that? Your alarm bells just go off. You know, any deal that's so good, it's too good to be true, is probably not true. Yeah, and sometimes you get that same sense with people and the things that they do. It's an interesting thing, this call to innocence. Now, I want you to notice this. Blamelessness has to do with our relationship with other people, but innocence actually has to do with our relationship with ourselves. One of the most miserable places a believer can be is where they, they're living a life where their heart motive and their hands' actions are not in alignment where what I'm doing may be good, but the heart behind it is actually evil. And by that, I mean selfish or self-centered. I am doing the right things, but I'm doing them for the wrong reasons. No one on the planet is, is more miserable than that kind of, of believer, except the believer whose hands are doing the wrong things and whose heart is wanting the wrong things. That's the most miserable person on the planet. But this picture of innocence, of sincerity, it, 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 it 
it says, listen, if we're going to reflect the light of Christ, not only do we have to be right in our relationships with other people, we've got to be right in our relationship with ourselves. There's got to be for a believer who's going to shine and shine bright in his or her house, whether it is at the Y or whether it is at the office or whether it is at the shop or whether it is at Tanglewood or wherever it is, if our lights are really going to shine as they should, we not only have to be blameless in our relationships, but we've got to be innocent in terms of our inner motivations. And that, what that means is that we have to live our lives honest and actively dealing with and asking about our motivations. We have to have an honest and active engagement with our hearts, the kind so that we know and own why we're doing the things we're doing. The why behind the what is absolutely critical. I have to be honest about those things. I have to be active in seeking God's help to know and monitor what's motivating me. Remember, the scripture says, the heart is desperately wicked. Who can know it? You can't know your own heart. I can't know my own heart. I have to have God's help to show me my heart. Because I naturally lean into what is best for me. And so do you. You naturally lean into what is best for you. You naturally think that way. God's working in an attitude that causes you to, 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 to work in a different way. He's also working into you a different character and conduct. And part of that has to do with your motivation. And so um, a, a believer who's going to be faithful is going to be all, uh, saying to the Lord, Lord, show me, show me my heart the way you see my heart and help me to know my motivations. I've never seen God fail in this. When I see that my motivations are really what the, I'm doing what I'm doing, not for him, but for me. When that becomes apparent, then I find uh, that the only cure is to go again to the cross and find fresh motivation in living for him because of what he's done for me. But I've got to be active in that. I've got to be engaged in that. And I've got to be honest about what I find there. Believers have to be innocent when it comes to their own condition. It's a curious thing. I'm never, ever uh, comfortable with myself when my heart and my hands are not in alignment. I'm never happy with myself. There's no joy. In fact, believers will always struggle with themselves whenever their motives and their actions aren't aligned with their fathers. Whenever they're not living out the family tradition. When not, when, whenever they're not being true to, to, their, to their daddy. There will always be this sense of disquiet. What happens in a believer's life, one of the indications that, there, that your innocence has been lost is that there is a sense of fear when it comes to God. You don't really want to run into his presence. There's a fear that overcomes you in that. And you begin to keep God at a distance. When, when we're not living lives that are innocent, when we're not being honest with ourselves about ourselves, there's a guilt that comes to dominate our relationship with him. And we begin to run from him rather than to him. And as we're running from him and fearful of him, what happens is that our light in a dark world grows dim. We find it hard to live with ourselves in the presence of our father because our motives and, and, our, and our deeds aren't in alignment. We find it hard to, to live with ourselves, but then we find it hard to live in his presence. And the world then finds it hard to see our father as he really is. So living with this innocence of sincerity is what keeps us shining brightly. Living without it keeps us from shining as we should. Wrong motives behind the best of deeds keep the goodness and glory of God from being fully seen and trusted. And this is the sad thing. Most people can spot a Christian faking goodness. Our world can always spot a Christian faking goodness. And do you, do you know why? Because they are experts at faking goodness. They know it when they see it because they're already good at it. 
And the great tragedy is when we're doing good things out of a misdirected heart, they not only lose confidence and trust in us, but they lose confidence and trust in our Father. We're not the only ones that come away looking as if we're a sham. He looks like he's a sham. And that keeps many people from pursuing Christ and the life and, 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 the, and the love uh, and the light that he gives. And it's a tragedy. Innocence in terms of our relationship with ourselves is that second quality. I want you to see the final one, spotlessness or, or being without blemish. This was a word that was used in reference to the kind of sacrifices that uh, were to be offered to God under the uh, Old Testament of the Old Covenant. Metaphorically, it came to be used to describe a person who was without guilt from sin before God. And so here the word speaks to the authentic believer's relationship and fellowship with God. All of us, of course, in Christ are without blemish in Christ because his righteousness has been exchanged for our sin on the cross. So we say, theologians like to say positionally before Christ, we are righteous, we are always righteous, and that can never change. We are always without blemish. But here the idea, what Paul is speaking to, is that believers should be in their experience and in their practice here what they are forever. They should be living before God without blemish. Now watch this. They should be living without the presence of unconfessed, unrepented sins. And just as in their relationship with others, so too in their relationship with God, believers should seek to keep their relationship with him clean and clear of offense. I should be living in such a way, and we call this ready forgiveness, uh, re ready repentance. Well, I should be living in such a way that as I'm living, when I fall, not, not only am I making things right with you, but if I fall and, not, and, and have offended you, I make it right with you, but I make it right Right with God. If I fall or I fail and I've offended him alone in some way, I quickly move to make it right with him. I don't let any unconfessed sin remain in my life. I don't let any practice, any habit remain in my life that I know breaks the heart of a holy God. I, I deal with it quickly. I deal with it immediately because what I want, what I desire with all of my heart is to be what Paul describes in Romans 12, two, one and two, a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to him. I want to be the kind of person that when he's ready to act and when he's ready to move in one of the spaces or places in my house and he's ready to, to uh, show himself, reveal himself through the light of Christ to an individual, I'm ready, I'm there, I'm, I'm on it and he can use me. If I have sin in my life, he cannot use me. My relationship with him is settled. My fellowship though with him is broken. And so when, when there is sin in my life, God's focus is not going to be on using me in a dark world. His focus is going to be on uh, strengthening my light where I am by dealing with sin. Does that make sense? So what God spends his time doing in my life is correcting or disciplining me when he wants to be taking my life and using me for his glory in my house or in, yeah, in my house for his glory. Yeah. Does that make sense? Look, here's our problem. Ours, mine, yours. This is our problem. So much that God has said is good, our world now says is evil. So much that God says is evil, our world now says is good and acceptable, that we've gotten to the place where we're having a hard time discerning between the two. And one of the things that's happening to believers in our culture 
is that we no longer identify sin as sin. We identify so much that is sin as acceptable. And we immediately find then ourselves prey to that sin, tempted to that sin, engaged in that sin, involved in that sin, which removes us from a place of usefulness. We get knocked out of commission because we have harsh attitudes, critical attitudes, because we have the presence of sin in our lives and the things that we do, the things that we say. We tear each other down. We tear the world down. We, we, we aren't displaying good. We're displaying the same mumbling and grumbling, and you get the picture that everyone else is doing, and we are no different. And God cannot use us because we are not clean. And metaphorically, that's the way we take the basket Jesus talked about and cover our lamp and leave it covered. The basket. Look, I know that not everybody in our house, even when we're shining at at the brightest that we can and we put the lamp as high as we can on the highest lampstand that we can so that we've got light in every area of of our houses, every stay and play and eat and shop and all those things. Not everybody, when we shine the light, is going to see it because they don't want to. And it breaks my heart. So keeping the condition of our lives blameless and innocent and unspotted before others, before ourselves, before God, becomes a critical part of our letting his light shine. So what we have here in short is this. God is working into us a new attitude that is a glad, other-oriented, self-denying attitude that leads to service, but he's also working into us a new character and a new conduct that can be described as one of purity. And so God is working into us humility, and he's working into us purity. And when our attitude is not driven by self and, and self-centeredness, but on what God, it, 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 what God desires, and that is good and life and salvation for others. When our attitude isn't driven by self, and, but driven for God's good, to see God's good in the lives of others, what happens is sin begins to be set aside in favor of righteousness, righteous dealings, and, 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 and doing good things for others. And purity rather than impurity begins to characterize our relationships with them. And when that happens, we begin to make the most of the light we have in the houses we live in with the time we've got. So here's, I guess, my plea for this morning. Please, if you're a follower of Jesus... Please know this, how you and I live in our houses matters. What we show and what we say with our lives matters. It matters to God because he is our father and he wants to see Christ shining through us. It brings him great pleasure and there is no greater joy for a believer than to bring a smile to the face of the father. It matters to him what we say and do and how we live. But it also, and I want you to see this, it matters for others. 
for all those who live in the spaces and places that make up the houses of our lives. The people who can be found where we stay and play and shop and eat and work and network and worship and live among neighbors and, and among extended family, wherever we attend school, get help, receive help, whatever. They need to see from us an attitude of humility, of self-denial, of, oriented, uh, self, of other-oriented service. They need to see a humble display of purity, of blamelessness and innocence. They need to see an unspotted character producing the same kind of living in relationships as Jesus. They need a chance to hear, finally, a gospel explanation for that humility and for that purity. So here is the challenge. Here is the challenge. Did you find your card already? Did you already sneak a peek? Did you already sneak a peek? Did you find your card? You'll see one side is one side is blue and the other side is white. I want you to pay attention to the blue to the blue side. The blue side is is the important side. That is my favorite color just so you know. But we wanted to make this look like a uh, we wanted to, to make this look like a blueprint because I want you to think about your house right now. I want you to think about the house of your life right now. And uh, if Jesus tarries till next Sunday, we're going to be thinking about our houses one more Sunday and then we're going to go back to the gospel of John. Unless the Lord says, talk about light more. But right now I'm thinking just one more Sunday is what I'm thinking. All right, I want you to look. You know, here's, this is a tool. What I've put in your hands is a tool. If you're a follower of Jesus, I want to ask you to think about your house. I want to ask you to think about right now your house. And I want you to look at that, at that blueprint. And what we've done is we've divided this up into rooms that describe where you stay. That's the home you actually live in. So you all got, got a little boy in your house. He's one of those people in, your, in the place where you stay. So you're going to minister to that little boy as, in the ways that we're going to be talking about. Does that make sense? So where you stay, where you play. Uh, I don't have my glasses on. Where you shop, where you eat. You got yours on. Where you work, network, worship. Uh, this is one of the spaces in your house. Look around you. These are some of the people in your house. You got a lot of people in your house. Have you noticed that? You got a lot of people in your house. Yeah. Who, I want you to think about those places, but then I, here's what I want you to do. Who are the people in those places? Now, you work in construction. You manage all kinds of projects. You've got all kinds of people in your, in your house. Now, you've got a Got a little one now in your house, but now you're also heading over to High Point and you're doing lots of work there, right? And you got a lot, and so you work in construction, so I'm imagining you work with some really strong people. <laughs> strong language, strong attitudes, strong actions. Is that correct, sir? All right. Wow, what a house. <laughs> See, here's the thing. I want my brother to be thinking about the, those people in that room in his house. Because here's what I know, is that he's called to be a light in that place. In fact, I believe with all my heart, God put him in a position, uh, and, and he's got some leadership and responsibility where he is, as I understand it. God's put him there to be a light. You work in IT, don't you? Computers, they don't need to be saved, but... The people who work with computers, yeah, and those of us who have to use them, sometimes we feel like we need fresh help. But anyway, the same goes for you. So here's what I'm asking you to do, and I'm earnest about this. I, I know I can pass out cards all day. You take them, you throw them, away on, throw them away on the way out, or they write on your dash for a couple of weeks. Or... I'm trusting God's going to do a fresh work in your life and your heart and, and that this is going to actually mean an eternity's worth of difference in the lives of somebody you already know.
So, I want you to look at this. I want, I, want to, I want to challenge you to begin to look at this. Look at the places and spaces in your house and ask yourself, who is there? In fact, what I would recommend to you is that you take this and, and lay it before the Lord and say, now, Lord, help me to see and remember who is there in that room in my house. You see where play is? That could be the why. It could be the golf course where you play golf or whatever. What do you do when you play? Gym. Gym? There you go. What, you play basketball? What do you do? That's work out. Work, oh, you work out. All right. There's a ton of uh, gym junkies and, and, and folks there. Yeah. Um, so you got, got a mission there. Yep. Boy, I've got everybody's attention now. If I get close to you, you just know I'm going to talk to you. <laughs> Point something out. I know. It's, it's, it's why. But So here we are. I want you to think about who's in your house. Spread it before the Lord and say, Lord, who, who needs? Everyone needs the light of Christ. But who in my house needs that light the most? Who in my house might be the most open to that light? Where do I need to be the light of Jesus intentionally? Look at the third question. You see, first, what's in your house? We've marked that out. Secondly, who's in your house? But thirdly, where in your places and spaces is the darkness greatest? Where's the darkness greatest? Where's the brokenness the greatest that's coming from death and darkness and, and sin? You're not doing this to be judgy. Good night. You and I have nothing to be judgy or, or to be condemning about. We are sinners saved by grace. We are only sinners by God's grace saved. So there's no reason for judgment, criticism. We're not doing that. Uh, that's not what God's called us to. But the, but the issue is, Where's the darkness greatest in these spaces in my house? Where is there a lack of life and light? And what, what will begin to happen as you take this seriously is that God's going to begin to sensitize you to the work and the mission that he's given you to do. To be a light in the darkest places. Please understand if you are an authentic follower of Jesus, you are who you are and you are where you are to make an eternity's worth of difference in the lives of the people around you. So start here and then go there. Start here and then go there. And, and here's the reality. My brother working in High Point, he may have, I don't know, 50 people he could put on his list, but I, I have a sense that probably what's going to happen is God's going to show him three or four. He's got a responsibility to more than that, but God knows we're flesh and we can only do so much. He's going to, there are going to be three or four. Just, I, I promise, there'll be three or four. And suddenly they become a matter of awareness and they become a matter of prayer and they become a matter of a concern. And I began to think about them and I began to say, how can I do them good? How can I bless them? How can I encourage them with the light and the life of Jesus? 
How can I do that? How can I, how can I make a difference? How can I help them to flourish, to grow? Does that make sense? I mean, look, even retired people can do that. Do you know that? You do? You don't? You do? Yeah, because you got rooms, you got places, you got spaces. The important thing is to see your house, know who's in it. Begin to pray, and as God gives you a burden. I got a brother right here already writing. I love it, man. Keep writing. Pray God will change some lives out of what you're doing right now. I believe he will if we'll be faithful. So here's your homework for this week. I want you to take this card. I want you to keep this card. I want you to use this card. I want you to bring it back next week because we're going to have a special time of commitment this next week. I'm excited about this next week as Jesus tarries. Bring it back. If you lose it or forget it, we'll have another one for you. We won't be completed, though, but we'll have another one for you. All right? You and I see brokenness every day. A brokenness that can only be healed by the light of him who gave himself, right, for us. Lord God, um, we were made and met and sent to be bright lights in this dark world of ours. Father, there are literally thousands and thousands and thousands of people represented in the, by the homes in this room. So many need the light of Jesus. God, by your grace and your mercy. Revive us again. Create in us a fresh desire as individuals, as families, as life groups, as a church, to be the brightest lights we can be in the darkest places in our houses. I commit your people to you, Lord, and to this week of seeking you and asking these questions that have such an impact potentially for eternity. Grant, Lord God, that you would find us faithful with the houses you've given us for Jesus' sake. Amen and amen. Thanks again for listening. If you'd like to dig deeper into this message, you can access the discussion guide right where you found this message, either on the website or over at the Center Grove app. Also, head to cglife.org to learn more about Center Grove, what we're up to, and how to access even more resources. Thanks again for opening God's word with us today. We hope that you've been encouraged and challenged to walk deeper in relationship with him.